We're driven by the search for better. But when it comes to hiring, the best way to search for a candidate isn't to search at all. Don't search match with Indeed. Indeed is your matching and hiring platform with over 350 million global monthly visitors, according to Indeed data, and a matching engine that helps you find quality candidates fast. Ditch the busy work. Use Indeed for scheduling, screening, and messaging so you can connect with candidates faster. Leveraging over 140 million qualifications and preferences every day, Indeed's matching engine is constantly learning from your preferences, so the more you use Indeed, the better it gets. Join more than 3.5 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. And listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Just go to Indeed.com slash BlueWire right now and support our show by saying that you heard about Indeed on this podcast. That's Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. What is up, Cal fans? We are back with another episode of the Golden Bearcast, a proud partner of the Blue Wire Podcast Network. We are here after a tumultuous experience that was UNLV. I am reporting live from Chicago, future home of the Golden Bears, and alongside me back in Berkeley or technically Emeryville, but we're going to say Berkeley today. My co-host, Rob. Rob, what's going on in your world? Andy's our boots on the ground. Way early. You're, go- you're getting in there. You're scouting out enemy fort territory. You're seeing what it's like out there. I- granted, we're not even going to be in Chicago. <laughs> we're gonna we're driving down for another two hours to South Bend. I'm bringing the hype. I'm bringing yeah. the hype. I wore cow joggers on the plane. I got the loudest Go Bears from the gate agent at Southwest I've ever heard. And I rocked the full home field apparel Gura tee in the gym Mm -hmm. today. And it's like at the Midtown Athletic Club. So hella folks here. So I'm rocking it. And then I had, I realized at the gym, I was also rocking the cow shorts. No shortage of cow representation happening so far in the city of Chicago. And tomorrow reinforcements arrive. And then it's going to get real rowdy, folks. The reinforcements keep arriving until Saturday morning. Yeah, they don't really stop arriving. I think even some might even be arriving Saturday morning, but that seems unlikely. (laughs) Some might actually even be dropping in straight into South Bend. Parachuting, actually. Yeah, exactly. But Parachuting, yes. yes. We need to do some therapy here. We need to exercise (laughs) some serious demons from this UNLV game. Yeah. My goodness. What a game for you to not be there for. That was something. <laughs> so first. So let's. let's We need to preface this. Because like. So Andy was at the game. Andy was at the game as a fan. Like he was sitting in the stands. And he was texting me the entire time. Sending me pictures the entire time. On the flip side, I was in San Diego getting ready for a wedding. I was on with uh, Christopher H. and some of the other guys on Get Playback up until we had to leave. So I think we watched maybe all the way to the end of the third quarter, maybe missed the start of the fourth quarter. Uh, we did end up watching. Uh, Nam will forever say he was not watching, but he <laughs> clearly was on my phone. The last like three or four minutes of the game, I saw the stop. I saw them get the ball back. And then I saw the interception to end the game. So, yeah. So I I've, I saw the majority of the game. Granted, it was in the midst of, like, getting ready for a wedding. So, like, it was just in and out of the bathroom. Like, I was watching, not watching. I do – I did watch – we did watch the first and second quarter very intently. So that's – I can talk to that specifically. But the rest we're going to have to talk about. And, uh, you know, I, I did do my little rewatch and – I'll go through first the and second quarter. Bit, you're going to be like that is that's <laughs> preface. You come away from the from that and be like, wow, we look great. 
All right. Well, so let me just yeah, go through yeah. the summary. Let me uh, go through the but summary. that's the preface. Summary here. First quarter, Cal 14 0 over UNLV. Everything's happy, happy dory. If that's even the expression, hunky dory. <laughs> Second quarter, UNLV answers 14 7. Then Cal goes up 17 7. There was a critical drop mixed in there uh, that prevented Cal from getting into the end zone. Uh, it was a uh, Maven Anderson who had a great couple of plays. Uh, just Plummer rolled that to the right. He bought himself extra time on the sideline. I don't know if Anderson was expecting to see the ball come out. Hit him right in the hands in the end zone on the six-yard play and just dropped. And then on the very next play, Plummer threw an interception. So that was really important uh, because that felt like it could have taken the game just to the enough of a gap where Cal really could have sat on that lead. Well, flash. Cal sat on that lead anyways. They, uh, <laughs> they, they didn't care. 17-7 to was just fine. UNOV came back and uh, scored a touchdown in the third. That may, uh, like, I think we might have had a field goal at that point, actually. So I think it might have been 20, and then they answered back to uh, 14. Yeah, it was... It was... Yeah, it was twenty to seven at the eight minute mark in the third quarter, and then they hit the they scored the run, rushing touchdown at There's the seven also, minute mark for twenty to fourteen. Sorry, yeah, uh, apologies on the interruption there. The key play that happened on that was a fifty fifty ball that it looked. I think it was Craig Woodson that. Yeah, the interception or the catch, interception catch call. ball, which I thought they got. I mean, it looked like to me on replay it was very clear that Woodson had the ball first and the receiver latched on afterwards and they went to review yeah. by the way i had the best view of the review and it turns out they don't see anything <laughs> so i was like actually able to see under the curtain and it's like they're looking at the same replays we're looking at on the the tiny video boards at memorial stadium it's absolutely hilarious yeah. So clearly, I think that call is coming from above. I, I think it was the wrong call. Um, Wilcox was furious about it. I think most people believe furious. it's the wrong call. And it was huge. They scored on the next play on a broken yeah. tackle. And um, and then that's where it would remain. Yep. 20 to 14 the rest of the way. Stress levels through the roof. It says the attendance was 38,000. I'm not going to believe that, but there was at least 25,000 in the stadium that all and, and maybe Isaiah lost a year or two off that. their lives. And then we won. Okay, so there we go. That's the win. <laughs> yep. And it was it was a nice catch. It was a nice catch. So maybe some mm -hmm. quick player stats, because um, I do think we're going to come back and reference these. So just on the Cal side, Jay Knott, seven rushes. He gained 53. He had one touchdown. His average was uh, 7.4 per rush. Mm -hmm. Damian Moore, 6 for 26, 4.3 average per rush. To Carlos Brooks, 10 for 26. Um, and uh, he had 2.2 yards per rush. Jack Plummer was 28 of 39 with one interception, one touchdown, and 278 yards passing. He was sacked four times on the day. All of those felt important. And then as far as receivers, J. Mike uh, was actually had the most receptions. Jeremiah Hunter had the most yards. Neither of them saw the end zone. Jaden Ott was the only receiving touchdown. And, um, and those were the two that he had in the first quarter uh, that really made it seem like this game was going to be an easy win. Yeah. I, I mean, we could talk about Ott in that first quarter, but it, when we were watching it in the in, at the Airbnb, I was like, "This, this dude cannot be stopped. Like, it's just, it's ridiculous. Like, just, yeah, just his ability with the ball in his hands. Like, I don't know. Someone asked me about that. Like, why we went away from that towards the end of the game. Like, why we didn't go to hot. And I, I think." If we had gone back to Ott, I think the production would have remained the same. I'm not I'm not going to deny that. The only thing I would say is 
I'm very hesitant to put a true freshman's body on the line like that at running back when the running back position is arguably one of the most hit skill position spots. Like, pass pro, when they have the ball in their hands, um, it's just the amount of hits they take. And it's not like he's had, you know, real college hits on him yet. So that's why I'm kind of hesitant. I'm kind of glad that they did it. Like, I'm looking at the touches. In the first quarter, Ott had one touch. Uh, let's see. Yeah, the first quarter, he had one rushing touch. And I believe... And then also the, the pass catch for the touchdown. Um, in the second quarter, he had... Uh, three touches and one touch on the ground or on, in the air. So that's four touches right there. And then I think the remaining came in, in later in the game. So they gave him his touches early uh, and then they were up and then they went away from it and they kind of gave it to DeCarlos, which I was fine with. If they want, if they're, if the game plan going in was to get DeCarlos going a little bit, you gave more trying, like gave it as, you gave him the opportunities to in game one and then also early on in game two. You kind of wanted to get your third running back going because you hadn't been able to give him that many touches in meaningful time early on in the game. And that's what they want. If that's what the game plan was, I'm perfectly fine with it. Um, it's clear when Notre Dame is going to be looking at these two games going, look, Ott is the guy we need to be worried about. But at the same time, from a game planning perspective, you have to plan for all three guys because of just the balance amount of touches that the coaching staff has been giving all three of them. Um, I think that that is your initial point about Ott and injuries and a freshman body and a high contact position is an interesting one. Didn't expect it. I think that was a really good call out. I will disagree with you on the, the no issues with it just from I'm going to give you the perspective of somebody that was there. Um, not that it yeah. makes too much of a difference to watch the game, but <laughs> that's going to be just the perspective I'm coming from. The eye test for me was that DeCarlos was garbage. <laughs> like slow to hit his gaps, like not seeing the field. Well, the O line's not getting any push. We'll talk about that. And I have a, a, some points to kind of talk about the O line, but to, to me, DeCarlos was not working. And then you add on top of it that Damian actually looked good. So when Damian came in the game, he looked good. The stats back it up, like 4.3 yards per rush. Like, But he looked good. When you get the ball back in your own, you know, with the goal line or close to a goal line stand up six, and now you need to rush three times, and you go back to DeCarlos, who had a, at the time was averaging, what, three yards per carry? While you had Damian Moore, who was – looking and seeing the field better, I think that that deserves a lot of questions because you could have, you could have lost this game. They, this game was so frustrating on, on so many levels because it was an opportunity for Cal to prove to their fans, to prove to everybody there that they had evolved from being the same team that we have seen for the last five seasons. And, this statement of a game was a resounding, we are still the same. We still haven't graduated from doing the same things that we have done the last five seasons. And so that that was incredibly frustrating to me. Not that it had to be ought in that situation. To me, it clearly should have been ought in that situation because the situation dictated that you go and win the game. I would never put DeCarlos in. I mean, could you imagine if I was the head coach and – I go into the presser and we lost. And they asked me about that series. And I was like, well, we had to get an even number of touches. You guys would be like, I'd be fired. <laughs> I'd be chased out with pitchforks. Like there's no way that would never fly. And so I think when the game is on the line, the situation changes. And it's like college football is so fickle. One win means so much. We've seen it with this team, with this with this leadership. Like one win means everything. It's the difference between bowling and not bowling. It's the difference between a Pac-12 championship and not. You know, it it's one win, 
And obviously out of conference isn't going to factor into the Pac-12 championship, but like, um, I still think it, it, you would never, in my opinion, you should never risk losing. I, I, and I don't know. I just don't know what they saw with DeCarlos. I, it just was so clear to me that with the way that the line was not getting pushes, like it needed to be Damian who has proven that he can break the first you know, make the first guy miss or break that first tackle, or you needed to just kill him with speed, which was, you know, you look at the Jaden mm-hmm. Ott run in the fourth where he was hit like behind or like he was, the, the guy was totally freed up yep. and he just put him on ice skates and was like, no. Nope. And then the next guy was like, no, 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 no. I'm way yeah. faster than you. I'm just gone. <laughs> And you're going to tell me that we're going to put that talent on the sideline with, and, and then we ended up giving the ball right back and giving UNLV another shot at, at winning the game. I don't, I don't know, man. It's a tough sell for me. I think, I, I think you're looking at it the right way. I think I'm just approaching it more from the fan side where it's just really frustrating. Like, no, no, I, I think what I'm doing is I'm approaching it from a big picture of the season. Look, um, Mm-hmm. Whereas you're looking at it just the game, and I I am fully on board with it. If I was if if this was a Madden game, right? If I'm playing a video game and it's a one off, like yeah, I'm putting odd in in every single every single snap, like every single position. the The point I was making with that was just the long term longevity of him. Like you, I don't, I don't know. Maybe his body can take it, but just from just from like being around football enough over the last few years and stuff and just seeing how much wear and tear these guys' bodies take, like especially as a freshman, like I think I think they're just trying to save him for the brunt of the rest of the season, which is, as you said, infinitely more important. Not to say that these games aren't, but if if it, if if you know if you can take away a couple of these snaps here so that you can give him a couple of those snaps when we play Oregon or when we play UW or when we play UCLA, I don't know I, if if the if the snap count is set, like which I don't think it is. Um, I would be okay with that. Um, I think. So here's my interesting take that I I want to get your thoughts on. All right. So mm-hmm. in my mind, mm-hmm. in my mind, this the season has started off exactly the opposite in which we started off last season. I honestly feel like last last week's game against Davis feels very much like the TCU game. All right. Where we came out guns blazing. We tried to do we tried to throw deep. Like we tried to we tried to jump the just jump start the offense. It didn't work early on, but if it it mellowed out and our offense started to click down the line and then our defense held well, of course the TCU game, our defense didn't hold in that game. But you get the general sense of what I'm trying to say. Whereas this game felt very much like the Nevada game. Um, it felt very much in that, like, here's what we can do. Here's what we're good at. We're going to execute. We're going to score early. And then we're not going to mail it in. But they, I think they felt as though the talent level on this team could maintain to get the victory with what they were doing. Clearly, clearly, UNLV made adjustments and they started to play better as the game went on. Um, But this was that same gamble, I think, that they took in the Nevada game where I think they thought, look, I think our talent can help us win, like just win it out. Like we can play a short, short playbook and all that. And I think our talent can wait out. It backfired on them badly. I think this is the game where you saw maybe if it was the same idea that it worked out here because the talent level was superior over UNLV's. I don't think that's a good way to approach it. Um, but I do understand if that was the case where they wanted to save some stuff for Notre Dame. Um, like I tweeted this out earlier today. There's a lot of things I saw at fall camp that I, and myself and Jesse included, I think I can speak for Jesse on this. There were a lot of things we saw them working on that we haven't seen yet which is kind of confusing um, because our analysis of it was they're practicing it this much because this is going to be a staple of the offense. This is going to be like what our offense is based off of. We haven't seen like 80% of it. I I don't know what they're saving it for. Maybe, maybe they, maybe that's the, maybe that's the mindset. They think that 
our talent level is good enough where we can kind of cruise through the first two, two and a half games. And then the Notre Dame game is kind of where we have to show it a little bit just so we can try and get that victory out. And then you go into conference play and just open up the playbook and, and go from there. It, you kind of saw it last season too, right? Like we didn't really see the playbook being opened up until later in the season. Then it exploded at the big game. Um, yeah. Or even Oregon, the Oregon State game too, to a certain degree. So even the TCU game. Yeah, even the TCU game. So I think that's kind of what they're building up towards. That's that's at least my look on it just from previous years of what we've been watching. I don't think it's the right way to do it because, as you said, college football wins are so fickle that why would you risk that in order to get the win? But I'll... But like my devil's advocate, like the other the other side of that for me, like if they little angel and little devil sitting on my shoulder, like this is the other <laughs> this is the other side of it, right? Which is like they got the win. Like am I am I upset about it? Like they got the win. Like if I'm if they got if they lost, we're all up in arms, right? But if that's the gamble they took and it paid off, great. You just can't keep betting on that, which I don't think they will. Um, we've seen it that they start they start to open up both on offense and defense as conference play goes. In goes into effect but yeah past precedent isn't on your side yeah in that uh, over maybe overlooking an opponent i don't think i so so for me my perspective is i bring a friend who hasn't attended a cal game in since the marshawn era you know who loves football big raiders fan raiders left hates the raiders loves football so i hit him up he comes and and you know, at the end of the game, looks at me and he goes, "Damn, like that was that was so stressful." He goes, "Like you do this every week," <laughs> and I was like, "Yeah, I do." And it was it was very stressful. And those are the people that you're just not going to get back. You just don't get them back. Um, that game, if you win that game, forty plus points, you get those people back, and you make a statement. UNOB isn't even in the same building as we are. Instead, we play down to our opponents as we play up to the elite opponents that we face. And I hate it. I hate it. It drives me crazy. As an athlete, we don't, like, you have to be able to come in and put, take away their hope. You have to take their hope. And you have when you have the opportunity, you have to take it away. And all we did in that game was give UNLV more hope. And I think it was because I sat right behind the sideline. I could feel the energy of the UNLV team. I could hear them. And so, like, imagine all these old blues that have these great seats. And I, I wasn't in those great seats, but like I was down towards the end zone. And they're just hearing and feeding, like they're seeing this team believe more. Every single minute that went by, every single three and out that we had, the UNLV team, coaches are hyping up their players. Players are coming back like they can't handle they can't handle this. Like they were building that belief, pull that upset, and we're sitting there watching this, and you're like, "Come on, Cal, just put it away. Like you have this game, just put it away. All you need is a touch. Like all we really needed was a touchdown. Touchdown would have put that game away. And what happened is we kind of went for field goals when we could have gone for touchdowns. And then when we needed the field goal, we missed it. But the stupid thing about that field goal was we got the ball in there 45. We couldn't advance the ball better than a 42 yard field goal. When we started on their own 45, when we're trying to put the game on ice, dude, like that to me was unacceptable. And I, I would bet there might have been some right for California yep. people on the other side that felt just as passionately based on one of Nick's tweets <laughs> of, about that. Because and so for me, it's like you have to have the kill mentality. You have to know and sense it and you have to put that team away because you cannot what you cannot do with a team that is an underdog against you is continuously give them belief. And all we did for basically a quarter and a half was do that. And it was frustrating as hell to be a part of. Um, and so I think for me, that's – I would look at this and I would say this didn't work. They need to stop doing this. This is this is enough and you're only going to piss off the fan base further by letting a UNLV come into our home stadium 
and act like they are at the same level when they have like six conference wins in the last two seasons or something crazy. They were terrible. And like, look, we have, there's a lot of, there's a lot of familiar faces on that sideline. There's clearly better coaches and coaches like Marcus Arroyo, who I actually worked with, believe it or not, way back when, um, that have ties to the Cal program. So like, you know, good for them for turning it around. But like that quarterback was like Zach Maynard level of consistent. He <laughs> like, was not yeah. good. He had some bad, bad throws. throws. And um, I just felt like we wanted our – it's like almost like our offense was like, come on, defense, win this game for us. And like, Well, I mean – can I can I give you can I ask another point off of what you just said like a devil's advocate type of question? Of so course. like you talk about like you want them to to put the clamps down to to just to put the game on ice. Couldn't you look at this game and argue that because of Justin Wilcox and just his mentality of like building a hard top 20 defense first and foremost, like that's where he thinks will win games. The defense the defense did actually put down the clamps and win them the game. Like what I'm saying is if, if this was a Sonny Dykes head coach, like he's, he's telling the offense, go win this, win, go win us this right. game. I think with Justin Wilcox at our helm, he's telling the defense, go win us this game. And you could argue that that's exactly what they did. Mm, each. I, I just don't think so. I don't think in the way that I, at least that I'm defining it. I, I don't think they met that, that standard because you just didn't see the belief. Like, you didn't see the belief disappear. And, like, with Davis, you saw the belief disappear after the pick six. That's when you saw that whole sideline. All right. Davis believed in themselves for a little while. Like, there was belief over there, especially in the first half. And then pick six happened, and they're like, all right, this one's over. Right? So I think, like, that, it, it just, when you never, when you never get that sideline to admit defeat, when you never get a program that's, that's, ranked as low as UNLV and in a, in a rebuilding state to admit defeat themselves. Like, yeah, you can point at that and say, okay, that's, that's good coaches for getting their players to believe that wasn't the coaches. Yeah. They, they believed based on how the game was going. That was worse. We're, we're get we're dominating the, we're beating, we're winning the battle in the trenches. They can't rush. Like Cal can't rush against us. We're getting pressure on the quarterback. Quarterback is making bad reads. They're going three and out every drive. And, in the meantime, we got a kind of good running game going on. We're doing well. And, like, that's – so, to me, it's like the defense, it's just not – I don't know, man. It's not one of those things where I looked at it and was like, okay, six-point lead, our defense, guaranteed victory. It's just not because, like, six points isn't enough. Yeah, if they, if they had gotten that to nine, totally with you. I think you could make the case if they had gotten it to nine – or if Maven Anderson catches that touchdown and they do the same exact thing, everybody probably feels way different about it because the game would have been out of reach. This game wasn't out of reach. And therefore that's my stance. <laughs> that is my, or I mean, I guess I, I guess that that plays into the point or the question I was trying to make, because what you're saying is that if the offense had scored just one more, this would have been fine, but the offense didn't. And the side of the ball that actually stopped them from scoring was ultimately the defense right and they they won them the game in that fourth quarter they got enough stops is what i'm saying from the defensive side yeah now i'm not saying i disagree with you or agree with you i'm just that's i just wanted to i just wanted to flesh out like what you were what you were talking about a little more yeah i mean i i think that it's generous though i mean you sort of have to meet with like what is fine by my expectation versus where Mm -hmm. i expect this program to be with as with a coaching staff that has been as confident as they have been about this season. Mm-hmm. I expect this, this to be a 40 to 14 game. We can we cannot, the rule of 21 still existed. The rule of 21 is still there. D- there had to be people in the stands that were like, come on, let's just get to 21. It's ridiculous. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Well, Nam was saying, Nam, Nam was saying that in, in the Airbnb. Right. So, we need just to Jesse's point on the preview pod. This needs to be the team that gets rid of that. That shows that they can get to thirties. That shows they can get to thirty-five and forties. Because 
I think that this brand of football of like we're going to win this game 20 to 14. It's like no one's going to believe that when you go and play Oregon. No one's going to believe that when you go and play USC. You're not going to hold Lincoln Riley's offense to 14 points. You're just not going to do it. You're not. Maybe this team can. I'm not saying like, but probably the odds aren't in their favor. So give us some confidence that the offense is going to do something. I'll move on. I have many other talking points here that I want to get through. So let me just throw you since. Let's go. All right. So I already talked about that crazy decision to play Brooks over Moore and Ott with the game on the line. That was nuts. <laughs> yeah. All right. So I've talked about quite a few of these. I want to talk about a couple of players. Player of the game, Daniel Scott. Daniel Scott won us this game. I mean, that was just incredible to see what one how much he disrupted those last two plays it was awesome and uh i don't think he got enough credit for it the uh yeah he he made up for that one missed tackle that lost or got us or got them that like 60 yard touchdown against davis like he made up for it in in this game like he cleaned up his tackling and he cleaned up he cleaned up his reads yeah i i mean he was tremendous. Um, I want to talk about the O-line. Sure. We're driven by the search for better. But when it comes to hiring, the best way to search for a candidate isn't to search at all. Don't search match with Indeed. Indeed is your matching and hiring platform with over 350 million global monthly visitors, according to Indeed data, and a matching engine that helps you find quality candidates fast. Ditch the busy work. Use Indeed for scheduling, screening, and messaging so you can connect with candidates faster. Leveraging over 140 million qualifications and preferences every day, Indeed's matching engine is constantly learning from your preferences. So the more you use Indeed, the better it gets. Join more than 3.5 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. And listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Just go to Indeed.com slash BlueWire right now and support our show by saying that you heard about Indeed on this podcast. That's Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. I heard something today. So this is going to be counter to basically my entire tone, this whole podcast. <laughs> I heard something, was it Sunday when I was watching kind of the review of some of the NFL games? And uh, one of the NFL teams, I can't remember which one, had a tough time with their O-line. I think it was Scott Van Pelt. It was just like, yeah, you know, sometimes it takes O-line a long time to gel. I was like, damn, all right. Maybe we don't give ourselves enough patience with Cal offensive lines. Because for the most part, it does seem like the Wilcox offensive line era (laughs) starts really slow and then closes pretty strong. And it was the same under Greatwood, too. I remember, like, the first four games under Greatwood, and we were like, what the hell is this? And then by the end of it, we're like, Greatwood's amazing. So I kind of have this question is, like, do you think that we're overly critical about the offensive line right now? I think some people definitely are. Um You have to – because I was talking to Peter about this when we were at the Airbnb, and uh, I was like, yeah, we're replacing three guys in the offensive line. He's like, well, technically four. And I was like, how so? And it's because Ben Coleman's moving to a new position. Right. And I was like, oh, yeah, you're right. So technically, the only guy that's in his position that he played last year for this offense is Sindrick. Everyone else is new. So yeah, they they this is their second game as a unit as a whole, and that's not even including some of the guys that are the backups, right? Like TJ Sessions, just came in in the fall. Siape Vaticani just came in in the fall. Like a lot of these guys are just just getting here, um, and so yeah, we're replacing a lot on the offensive line, like. I don't think there's many offensive lines that are going to hit the ground running this year out in the Pac-12 outside of a, a few because they're replacing everybody. Like even like the team we're facing next year or next week or this week, right? Notre Dame. They struggled early last season. And that was because they were replacing three guys that had moved on to the NFL. 
But what happened by the end, they were one of the best offensive line units in the country. Granted, of course, they're pulling like five star and high four star guys as as their recruits. But if that's if that's the the general like system we're looking at, yeah, it's gonna take a while for these guys to to gel a little bit. And that's also not even considering the fact that you have a new quarterback behind them. Like Cindric is Cindric has only snapped for Chase Garbers. And, like, knows what Chase likes to do when he's in the pocket or, like, when he's under pressure. So he knows, like, where to move and where to where to shift the pressures off. But he's playing. This is only the second game he's playing with Plummer behind the line. Uh, and I think they're still working some of those kinks out, which is why I think some of those sacks. Like, you know, Plummer got sacked twice last week. Looking back at the Davis game, one of those didn't really count because it was a guy that was outside of the box count. and They didn't account for him, and he just came off. But all, all the ones that are like just one on one guys that got beat and he gets sacked. I yeah, that that comes down to of course the one on one rep, but it also comes down to what what can the offensive lineman do as a last last minute thing because he knows Plummer likes to do a certain thing. Like if he feels pressure from the left, this is what he likes to do if he feels pressure. But I mean Plummer's pocket presence has been pretty solid. Um it just you can't yeah, you just Sometimes you just can't get away. It was weird. It felt like it felt like. Well, before I dive into that, you know, it's it's sort of like tying these two contradicting points together for me. It's one that we need to be more patient with the offensive line, but where the patience runs more thin is in our inability to recruit offensive line the way that Stanford does, and I just don't get why. I would love to ask one day <laughs> in the press conference and be like. Why why is Stanford able to to, to consistently it's, drive four and five star athletes to their offensive line and we're not? I just do not get it. Especially when Wilcox saw it so much at Wisconsin. Like their lines in Wisconsin are legendary. It's like it's there. The blueprint's there. I mean you could you could you could argue it's probably track record. Like just purely just on how many how many offensive linemen Stanford's produced and put into the NFL and with David Shaw at the helm. And that's been consistent. Yeah. Like, yeah, it could be, it could be. I just don't, I think when the pitch is, the opportunity is so similar, I think that makes sense, but I actually don't think that we would necessarily, I don't see us losing to Stanford on all of those alignment, like as if we're, we're recruiting the same ones. I I would think we'd be able to grab, you know, if we wanted to in a class, like three four star, you know, high four star guys. Well, how, based on what are we basing that off of? In regards to me recruiting them? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, just because oh, how many like because because how Very many simple. How, you are. Go ahead. You are a six foot, six six foot eight monster. Yeah. You have a decent brain. <laughs> and and you want to set yourself up for success both on the football field and in life. There's like five institutions in the country that can do that. Maybe six. And then you want to live in one of the most like affluent places in the world with probably way better weather if you're in Iowa. <laughs> right? Like, all right, I got sunshine. I have two different career paths for you, and I got a program that wants to run the ball the way Wisconsin does. I mean, I can go in and survey a bunch of high schoolers and have them give me objections to that, but I honestly would be curious what those objections are. Well, I mean, so here's the thing, right? Like, I don't know why. I don't know why all of a sudden we're talking about recruiting, but uh, we might as well. Um, when we tangent, we tangent hard. Yeah. I, so the thing for me with that point that doesn't really stick in my eyes is because, one, like, we're not the only guy that's recruiting these four-star, five-star guys. <laughs> like, that's first and foremost. Um, second is most offensive linemen guys aren't, like skill players like they know that it's going to take them a little bit for them to get into that starting lineup because it's body type it's it's work 
in the in the weight room to get yourself to collegiate level to learn the run and the blocking schemes for run for pass everything all of that sort so usually for any power five school you're not going to see a, fre- a true freshman like start right away unless you know unless you got like your name's Penny Sewell right um so that's the first thing so I think that's out I think that whole thing of like stay here for four years like we'll we'll cultivate you that's out the door because most colleges are are going to say that and then two like we don't have a track record of producing offensive linemen to the nfl with this current coaching staff like we can point to alex mack we can point to schwartz we can point um point to mccary but most of that doesn't hold any weight anymore um and then the next thing is like you look at the offensive lines and you have to kind of divide them up, right? Because you have tackles, you have guards, and then you have, like, guard centers. And, like, off of that, like, I'm looking at the, the list for this year, right? Five, first, top, the top offensive lineman, five-star offensive tackle, five-star offensive tackle, five-star offensive tackle, five-star in, interior O-line, Four star offensive tackle, four star offensive tackle, four star offensive tackle, and but the list goes on. But like you look at the list and the places that these guys are already committed, right? I'll take away the five stars. I'll only look at starting from the four stars: Notre Dame, Ohio State, LSU, Penn State, Georgia, Texas A&M, Oklahoma, Alabama, Clemson, Georgia, Florida State, Florida State, Texas A&M, Alabama, Clemson, LSU, Notre Dame, Texas, Ohio State, Alabama, Michigan State, Georgia, Baylor, <laughs> Clemson, Ohio State. Michigan, Michigan, Tennessee, Texas. Like, we're not competing with them from a recruiting standpoint. Maybe you can grab one, right? But grabbing one of those guys doesn't change the entire complexion of an offensive line because they're not going to be guys that are immediate plug-and-plug starters anyways. Yeah, I think that it's well said. I I don't know. I I maybe I'm in I might be thinking too highly, but I really don't understand I don't understand the 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 pitch that Florida State gives that rings more true than number one public university in the world. I really don't. I mean, but you could argue that that talking point is given to all recruits, right? I mean, Florida State, like what do you mean? No, no, I'm just the thing like is, I'm saying from our perspective. Like, like we're saying that to all the recruits. We're not. That's not. That's not a O line specific pitch. Oh no, it's not. But it's one where I think it matters. And like, I I would think that if you're gonna be in a position that takes a long time to break into, and you're gonna have an opportunity to get a degree, let alone maybe minor in some, um, have a major and a minor, because of the fact that it's not a plug and play role because of the fact that it's not a running back. It's not a talent skill position where it's like, great, you're a true freshman. You're Deshaun Jackson. I'm going to play you immediately. Then wouldn't the education mean more because you're going to spend more time there? Like who the hell is signing up to like Florida state has been in shambles, shambles. We should be able to out recruit that program. I'm, I'm, Helping my argument by selecting one team. <laughs> yeah, well, well, to be fair, but, the two guys that are four stars committed to Florida are from Orange Park, Florida, and from Clearwater, Florida. Yeah, <laughs> so I know Clearwater well. So yeah, I mean, and maybe we're not winning the guys at home, but or what, whatever it is, I, I think that aspect is hurting us. And I know we had a good, we had a couple of good O line guys we brought in this year. Yeah. So I I know there's been a lot of criticism of Angus, but he he definitely hold he does his work on the recruiting side of the ball. Uh, so all that to say, like I think we need to give it time, and but I think the concerns are valid. And then overall, as a fan, I don't understand. I still like ha- like have that question kind of come up where I'm like, damn, I, I can't believe that we haven't really been able to kind of do what Wilcox was literally trying to do from day one. <laughs> I think Nick talked about it. He was like, he was at Wisconsin. <laughs> you saw this. This is the blueprint. Wisconsin brings in these awesome alignment, and they just have super dope running backs right behind them. Just run teams to death and have great defense. Boom. Success. Anyways, we'll move on. That was a long tangent. 
I think the only other thing that I really haven't said yet is that Femi is a monster. (laughs) I felt like he stood out in this game in a way that I have not seen yet. First of all, the dude was like constantly trying to get our 25,000 fans into the game, like pumping up his arms, but he's humongous. He's a humongous human being. He could be. Oh, he's playing on Sundays. Yeah. He's 100% like, playing on Sundays. He really stood out in a way that I just like, you know, maybe it's my bad memory, but I just like had not, I think he had 10 tackles and led the team in tackles that game. Or he had a uh, ten total, like se- seven assisted and three solo. Yeah, one TFL. I mean, he just uh, him with Sermon. Those those two guys are are really important, and I, I felt like Femi really just was. It was cool to see. So it was maybe in the category of like my exciting player that I didn't expect to show up so much. I, I mean, not that we haven't talked about him, but you know. yeah. Femi is is as advertised. I that's the best way to put it. He's ex, he's if not exceeded expectations already. So, but like I my argument would be like the more important guy right now probably has to be Carlton. You've had Wendy's nugs dipped in sauce, but have you had them covered in sauce? Wendy's new saucy nugs take the crispy and spicy nugs you love. And turn them up to 11. Choose between flavors like buffalo or honey barbecue, garlic parm. Or if you're a real heat seeker out there, you can try spicy ghost pepper. Only on Wendy's signature spicy nugs. Listen, I'm going to dare you to do it. I dare you. That's seven delicious ways to try the nugs that you already love. Pick a flavor. Grab some extra napkins and then grab a few more napkins and prepare to nug like you've never nugged before. For a whole new way to nug, it's got to be Wendy's at participating U.S. Wendy's. Through two games, he has two and a half half sacks. Through two games. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, he's playing well. I think yeah, it's a shame that he and Brett Johnson aren't on opposite ends of one another. If he w- if Brett was here, he he's he's probably at like four four or five sacks already. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's huge. You can see the just the difference it is that we get when we can put pressure. Yeah, on the quarterback versus when we don't. I mean, we gave like that quarter. Their quarterback had a lot of time on some dropbacks, mm-hmm. a lot of time, and then that last series we really brought in the pressure, dialed up the pressure. I thought what Wilcox said was really interesting. It was just sort of like you put yourself in that position. It was a good job by the coaches. You know he shouted out. First of all, I think we might want to spend some time on that press conference. He shouted out the defensive coaches. He didn't say anything, not a word about the offensive coaches. He shouted out the defense coaches. Said, great job scheming him up. Great job knowing the situation. Great play call. Great job by the players. But, like, that's a pretty positive. That's like a ringing endorsement yep. from Wilcox. And then the second thing with the press conference is Jesse asked the best questions. Did you hear those questions? Jesse's good. They're I mean, amazing. that comes from a football coach, so of course. Would you would you would you expect yeah. any less from Jesse? I don't know if any listeners haven't watched it. If you just want to skip to the end, because Jesse asks his, his questions at the end, listen to Wilcox's reaction when Jesse asked that question. <laughs> and Wilcox knows Je- Wilcox knows Jesse him. too, so like, it's not. It's just an impressive question. Yeah. It's so good. And I think that it's it's really great to have someone in the room that isn't just asking. Like, I mean, how many times did we ask, how do you feel about Notre Dame? Were you overlooking this game because of Notre Dame? Were you guys talking about Notre Dame in the summer? It's like, hi, Daniel Scott, you, you just won this game on a walk-off defensive stand. How do you feel about Notre Dame? <laughs> Were you talking about them last summer? Like, come on. Do we have nothing better to write about than how we feel about Notre Dame? Yeah. Yeah. There has – like Jesse is setting – and you do it too. But you guys are – you have to – I hope you understand the importance that you are setting with the questions that you ask because you're going to force everybody else to be better. Yeah, or or they just use the answers off of our questions you know, for I'm not articles. Gonna... <laughs> 
that's fine. But like, if you're not there, let's hope that they come in and they're like, wow, okay, like, hey, that was a really good question. By the way, like, Justin, what did you see in this like defensive matchup? Like, or what did you see the offense doing in this situation? Um, you know, I think one of the questions I would love to have asked is the article that Avi wrote. Did you do this shit on purpose? It, it, did this game go according to plan? No one did. No one asked that. <laughs> Nobody asked that. Did this game go according to plan? It's a super simple question. Hey, coach, how you doing? Nice job on your win. Did this game go according to plan? I would have loved to understand. And, like, maybe he gives you a bullshit answer because he's upset. Wilcox, that's a, that's yeah. a pissed off Wilcox conference. But at way. least he answers it. <laughs> and you get an answer on the record. But he answers it. And, and you get an answer because it's like, we don't know. And then Avi writes that article. Like, I love that article because I think it was calling out the perfect thing. It's like, is this scripted? Are we are we experiencing scripted suffering? <laughs> yeah. I, I, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, all the guys write such, like, unique perspectives on the game. Like, Avi wrote that for Sunday. Nick does his thing on Monday. And it's like, in the, it's in the similar, similar vein of conversation because, one, we're hive mind at this point with everyone that writes for the site or has been associated with the site. So, you know, we're all thinking in in the same vein. Um, don't get me wrong. I also think in the same vein. I just, I just sometimes want to not to and force myself not to, but yeah, I think all of us generally think in the same line of thought when it comes to Cal football. So, I mean, yeah, that's, well, I think that's the thing too. I, I, I just wanted to highlight that. I think that one of the, things that I, I read, I remember is, well, okay. So I thought like Steve Croner asked this really good question. It was like Bruce Snyder yeah. said, there's no, no such thing as bad weather, yeah, yeah. something along those lines. It's not verbatim, but something along those lines. And I thought that that was like a really good question. And then somebody in the comments on the recap or on the uh, instant reaction, I think said the same thing. Aren't we overreacting yeah. here? Aren't we looking at this and looking at a win and, overreacting in a negative way at the end of the day it was a win and i was like damn maybe but like here's the thing with the hive mind i'm not on social media so like a part of that that twitter no but you you you're part of the hive mind because you've associated yourself with us for so long but like i didn't see with you guys but like think about it like i came in well i'm not saying about this game i'm just saying you've <laughs> you've we've already assimilated into your brain because you were a part of the site for so long and you are, are like we're still doing this. Like that's why I mean, like it, you're in the hive mind. You just don't know it. <laughs> I think that I I think that it's interesting that all three of us, if you use Avi, Nick, and myself, we all had the same kind of reaction to this game in different ways. Mm -hmm. And I yeah. think it comes from the fact that at the end of the day, we still want this program to be the best that it possibly can be. And I know I've said I'm fine yep. being seven and five every year because like ultimately I think like eight and five, like a bowl game win every year is success. And I literally think that Utah built their program on that. And that's something that I've said. And I understand that that's not, you know, widely believed opinion. Um, but like ultimately we, it is my preference for this program to lose zero games. <laughs> I want this program yeah. to be as possibly successful as it can be. And so that's what I would, when I say is like, is there such thing as a bad win? Probably not because you got the job done. And at the end of the day, that's what you were supposed to do. But this was a bad win. I actually wrote in my notes and wanted to get your thoughts. Is this the worst win that Wilcox has had in his entire tenure? The worst win? Hmm. I mean, North Texas last year, well, that was pretty bad. Um, I'm trying to think. Uh, I can't remember any Pac-12 games like off, like just off the bat. Um, yeah, I mean it has to be up there in ter if if that's the if if that's the adjectives we're trying to go for. Um, let's see, 2020. Uh, 2020 doesn't count anyway, so look back to 2019. Yeah, North Texas in 2019 was pretty bad. Um, one could argue that 
the Washington game was pretty bad. The uh, lightning um, lightning game. Yeah. Not the lightning game. No. Not the lightning game. The other one. The 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 only touchdown scored was a defensive touchdown by Evan Weaver game. <laughs> yes. And like that's at home. that's at a, home. that is an ug uh, yeah that is an ugly ugly win. That was an ugly win. Yeah. Um. I mean, it says something that it's up there. It's up there. It's on the list. It's on a short list because most of those are losses. Like you would put the Cheez-It Bowl number one and we win the game. Oh yeah, you yeah, put the Nevada absolutely. game there because if we had won the game, it's yeah. fascinating to me how often we lose those games. And I mean, yeah, I, I, I absolutely, I get it, I get it, and I, I've, I've been, I've been, I've been trying to hammer this point home. Like the people that are upset with Wilcox, how the games have gone, I get it. I absolutely get it. I'm watching the same games you are. I'm just as frustrated. Like, I absolutely get it. Like, my only thing is, like, one, we shouldn't put, like, a numerical number on, like, this is how many wins he needs to get this season or he's out. Or, as we're, we're as what we've talk, been talking about, which is what I wanted to say, was, like, it's game two. It's week two. Like... I don't think he deserves like all the leniency in the world of like, okay, maybe that was an excuse. Maybe that's a real excuse. Maybe that's a viable excuse. I I don't think we need to do that at this point anymore. But what we can do for a team is that's replacing more than 75% of their offensive talent, replacing four of their offensive linemen, one moving different positions, um, replacing both of their inside linebackers, one of their safeties and pretty much the entire defensive line. The least we can do is give them to mid season to figure out what this team really is. Like we could get to the Washington game and be like, dude, that was just growing pains. Like that's a possibility, right? Like I think we're, and but, but if this maintains by the time we play Washington, I think everyone's well within their rights to be like, no, we can't have enough of this. Or we can't have any more of this. Things need to change um, in some form or fashion. And I and I think that's a totally valid argument. I just think it's way too early <laughs> to be saying this team is hot garbage and cannot win more games after week two, <laughs> knowing how much we're replacing. Oh, I mean... Context, right? I'm still expecting this team... I. I largely expect this team to put themselves in a position to win against Notre Dame this Saturday. Yeah. And uh, I yeah, think the the facts, yeah. Four and one, five and one, they're totally going into the going into the bye five going into one, the bye week. Or, or just five and one or four and two. It's there, man. The opportunity is there. I haven't soured. i and I you know, I I mean I have never said that I would want Wilcox gone. Ever, and the reason why is I think he's a great coach. I just get frustrated. It's like the same way I get frustrated when Djokovic doesn't win six zero six zero six zero. I get frustrated because he's not perfect, and as a fan, I want him to be perfect. Because, or I used to before he became a poster boy for the anti vaxxers But like, <laughs> besides the point, <laughs> you know, as a fan. I want us to succeed in the highest possible fashion. And as a so, logical, in the real world, it doesn't work that way. And growing yeah. and, be, and being great is an ugly process. Let me, can I give you a hypothetical? Absolutely. If I told, if I told you, if I told you, I feel like an, I feel like an ESPN 30 for 30. If I told you, <laughs> Cal would go undefeated, but every single game would be this type of game. 20 to 14, like rule of 21 type games, just wrench your heart out every single game. Versus, versus team that goes to eight and five with like four games that are absolute blowouts. You enjoy yourself to hell. It's like the Stanford game last year, right? But the team caps out at eight and five because the offense doesn't produce or the defense doesn't play consistently at that level. 
which one would you rather prefer from like an emotional or, or fan fam? I get that you'd of course you take the twelve and zero, but just <laughs> I would imagine yourself on imagine yourself that both journeys had happened and you're at the end and you're like that was a good journey. Like which one would you prefer? So I think does the twelve and zero mask it? But yeah, I mean, eventually, when you win six of those and seven of those in a row, you start to just allow yourself to be okay. You get used to it. You're like, that's fine. Another one of these, sign me up. We're six and oh. It's worked this far. Right? I can talk myself, I can talk myself into that. Yeah. And especially, and it depends on your opponent. Because if you're beating Notre yeah. Dame and you're winning 20 to 14, like, yeah, that was a damn good football team. <laughs> we we came out with a win. Like you're happy. It's just like if we go to Arizona and we win twenty to fourteen, no, and the offense just completely disappears in the second half. People are gonna be like, against Arizona, <laughs> right? And then you go to Colorado and you play that game, twenty fourteen, <laughs> and the offense disappears again. But then you play game. Oregon and Washington 24, 20 to and fourteen, and then you're back. You're like, oh, all right, this is. This is <laughs> You know, I think you take it for a season. You know, Giants torture really only lasted one year. We like to say Giants torture lasted. It really only lasted 2010. You know, the Giants were really good in 2012. And then Madison Bumgarner happened in 2014. So, like, the torture year really only happened one year. I don't think there are a lot of Giants fans saying, damn, I really really love me some torture again. That shit was tough. That was hard to go through. But you go through it because you're getting the wins. The outcome is worth the pain, as, but you will yearn for something different. And I think that's what we see here, right? The outcome, people are happy with the yeah. outcome. They just are tired of the way that we're getting it. Please don't call for Wilcox's job to be gone. It could be a lot worse. Look at the basketball program. We've been through this before. It could be. Please don't do that. Please. It could be a lot worse. <laughs> Please don't put that talk jack out into the universe. We just don't need it. It just doesn't. It just doesn't God, it could be, be a lot worse. Yeah, it's. I just. I need. We need to hammer that point home. There is always worse, and at this point, it could be a lot worse. I. It, so if you want to, if if you want to be proven of this point, just look. Go, go Google how much Wilcox is making and then go Google where he stands like in all of college football in power five with head coaches or offensive coordinators and see who we would replace him with in that price range. It's not a fun, it's not a fun experiment. (laughs) I will tell you that it is not a fun experiment, but uh, yeah. Okay. We talked a lot about this game. We talked about the offense. We talked about defense. We talked a little bit about the special teams. I think we got to give the people a little bit of a preview of what's about to happen this weekend in South Bend, right? Just because we're going to Notre Dame. Like, I can't believe I'm saying that, that we're going, we're going to South Bend, Indiana to watch it with, to watch our bears play at Notre Dame stadium in South Bend, Indiana. I'm out here, dude. It's happening. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) It's already, it is, I mean, I it fly out Friday. Happening. Like, it's 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 wild. Like, look here. Here are the facts, and we've talked about this, right? The bus that we're taking down, Andy, you talked to them, and they said that they had to add more buses to their fleet because they weren't expecting this many Cal fans to fly in, and yet they still sold out of seats down in Notre Dame. So that's the first thing they sold out. That's amazing. Yeah, they sold out. Second thing. Cal's game against Notre Dame was the only game that was sold out by the time single seat, single game tickets went on sale on Notre Dame's website. That's number two. Number three is the number that I was told in terms of tickets sold from the Cal side. Some people were putting out the number of like seven or eight K higher, a lot higher. <laughs> This is going to be a massive, massive Cal turnout. Not to say we're going to take over the stadium like Ohio State did for ours. Like, like not, massive, no. massive. Let's, 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 yeah, yeah, not massive, massive. But it's going to be a larger contingent than what we saw probably at, like grouped together than like what we saw maybe at Texas or at Old Miss or UNC. 
This is like a, this is gonna be a big one. I agree. Um, I agree. It's gonna be wild. It's gonna be so wild. Like watching that Marshall Notre Dame game unfold. Like we had it on a second screen as we were watching the Cal game. Like because it was the end of it. Like oh my god. Like, holy hell, Marshall's really going to do this. Marshall's really going to do this. And Christopher H. on the other screen is like, Marshall, please don't win. We want to be the guys that beat them, not you guys. <laughs> um, but it just – it just, I wouldn't say it went from bad to worse, but it was just – they just did not look good. And then Buckner goes out with the injury. Pine comes in and on his first throw throws an interception. Like – and and they Marcus Freeman did come out and say this week that that Buckner's out. Their their star quarterbacks, yeah. their starting quarterback is out for four months. So Pine is going to be the starter in our game, playing in his starting his first game. You could probably you could probably maybe rattle him a little bit, but at the same time, you don't have tape on him. You have zero tape on the dude. You're probably going off of his high school tape in terms of his like scouting his tendencies and so on. So he could come out and just absolutely explode. Remember. Remember, like Tua, Tua Tango Vailoa just coming out and exploding when Jalen Hurts went down. Like, it could be that scenario. Not to say that Pine is Tango Vailoa, but that mm-hmm. that's the uncertainty sometimes you get with the back quarterback, especially in college football, because there's sometimes they're just highly rated guys that come in and they just play and it's, they're amazing. So, I don't know. I don't know what to expect. I somehow knew. I knew you were going to bring up that point. I knew it. I like. I knew it the second that I read yeah. that the starter was down. I was like, Rob's going to say we don't. that we don't have any tape on the backup. It's spot on, man. It's totally spot on. And I think, like, I would say, like, as a fan, yeah. like, let's be forgiving if the defense gives up a couple. I look at Christopher H. Yeah, look at Christopher H.'s offensive I think it's going to be on the offense. It's gonna be the <laughs> at offense the very the start, game. he, like, prefaces it because all of his all of his gifts that he had readied was about Buckner. And he had he had pretty much written this piece like two weeks ago, <laughs> and it's like on Monday. It's like, f my life. I, I have one gif on Pine. <laughs> like, so he went back and he he got some more tape on the dude. But yeah, there's not a lot on him. So, man, I am uh, I'm hyped. I'm so hyped for this game, and it's gonna be a lot of fun. If you're not making it out to uh, Chicago, um, we will be rooting on your behalf. But NBC, 1130, it's going to be a wild time, folks. It's going to be a wild time. Andy, do you have a prediction for the Notre Dame game before we close out for a while? Well, I've been saying that we're going to win this from for a while. So let's get crazy. Oh, my God. 30 to 27. Game-winning field goal? Cal wins. Yeah. Oh, damn. I said 30 to 27. Well, I'll stick with it. Oh, okay. <laughs> In my mind, it was 30 to 23. Oh, my God. Let's do 30 to 27. Sounds even more stressful. No, I don't think it'll be a game. It'll be a game-winning defensive stand. Oh. We do not win this game if our offense <laughs> needs to get the win. I am so down right now, and I think it's going to change. I think our offense – I think you're right. I think the playbook's going to open. The offense is going to look way better. I think there's going to be um, – a, 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 they'll do some things differently to open up the run game, and a lot of us will kind of be like, wow, why, yeah. why didn't we see this last week? And then, uh, you know, we it'll be close. It'll be a close one. I, and I'm so excited. I honestly think this is going to be the Jaden Ott welcome to college football, and you're going to be hearing his name over the next three years type of game. Wow, I'm not ready to say. That. I think I think it's <laughs> going to be not. that game. I think it's going to be that game. I and not because he's going to put up like you know 150 yards on the ground and like four touchdowns. Like not not in that sense, but like he's going to do enough against this team on national TV where people are going to be like, oh, he's he's a true freshman and he's doing that against this defense and this front line. He's going to be good in a couple of years or he's going to be good next year and he's going to be even better the year before. Like it's just going to be one of those things where when people look at Cal now, they're, that's the name they're going to immediately think of. Like and, you know, whenever we play on national TV or ESPN, they're always going to be talking about Jaden not now because of the showing that he had against Notre Dame. Score, please. My score prediction. Cal wins. 
35 to 21. I can't believe we're both going Cal win. All right. I w- answer me this. Would you have would you have said Cal wins if they were 2 and up? No. If Notre Dame was No, two and up? absolutely not. Absolutely <laughs> not. I tweeted this out. You didn't see this tweet, but I tweeted this out. If you had told me 2 weeks ago that going into the Notre Dame game Cal would be 2 and 0 and Notre Dame would be 0 and 2, I would have said you're crazy. <laughs> Yeah, you would have been like, you're hanging out with Andy J too much. One of us should have put a bet <laughs> down on this, a parlay bet on this. We would have won a lot of money. So true. <laughs> so true. <laughs> Next year. Next year we'll put down some crazy bets from like the first three games of the season. Just see where it takes us. I used to always bet on the on Cal winning the Pac-12 North. Every time I was in Vegas, I was in Vegas about once a year. I'd throw $10 on Cal winning the Pac-12 North. I did it every year. The odds are pretty solid. I lost. <laughs> odds are great. Yeah. Odds are wonderful. Yeah. The dent I, I lost uh, about 50 bucks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a smart move. All right. It's a smart play. It's the takeover of Notre Dame. I, th- I think we're going to be somewhere in the north parking lot or something like that. If you see us, come say hi. I'll be rocking a white Deshaun Jackson. It has been in my bag since early this week, and that's a good question of what I'm going to wear. Notre Dame. We are bringing the ruckus. We are bringing the ruckus. It's gonna be fun. It's uh, yeah. So the last thing I'll leave you with is Notre Dame is wearing their light green like leprechaun jerseys. It's like a special jersey for the year. It's like that Aaron Rodgers meme. I would hate for that jersey to be associated with a loss. <laughs> I would hate for it. I would hate for it to be associated with a loss. Shout out to my dear friend Ben, who is a big time Notre Dame fan, also a Cal grad, who has been eyeing this game for the last few years after this game went official, but is literally three hours away from a game attending another wedding this week. We were at the same wedding last week. Attending another wedding this week, but in Grand Rapids, Michigan, of his cousin. So, shout out to you, Ben. I'm sorry you can't make it. Um, and I know I know this is just putting salt in the wound, but I just wanted to give you a shout out because I know how much this game meant to you and that you're just not able to make it. Don't get married in football season. Hashtag, that is hashtag NAM. Cool. <laughs> hashtag NAM. Hashtag NAM. <laughs> That is the rule. For those of you who don't follow it, I do not understand. Yeah, but that's it from the Golden Bear cast. We talked about Notre Dame. We talked about the Davis game or the UNLV game. I said Davis. It's pretty much the same game. Uh, yeah, you can tweet at us at Golden Bear cast. You can write it at us at goldenbearcast at gmail.com. You can uh, – Find all the written stuff at rightforcalifornia.com. In terms of game week and when we're in Chicago, don't hesitate to tweet at us. We'll let you know like what we're up to, where we're doing. I think uh, I think we'll probably be out um, Saturday night after we get back to Chicago. So if you want to come hang out with us wherever we're at, um, just let us know. And we're happy to, to either revel in the victory or drown ourselves in sorrow after a, another heart-wrenching loss um, in any way, form, or fashion with a lot of... Andy's favorite beverage, Malort. <laughs> he's, wow. He's yeah. Just... I don't know about making it out Saturday night after drinking Malort, but <laughs> I will do my very best. I brought a ton of Advil. I'm ready for this. I've been training for this. I got I'm I'm, so excited. This is a side note, but Andy, I have uh, anti or like it's like hangover pills, like Korean hangover mm. pills, right? That a friend gave me. I'm gonna bring those, so you're gonna you're gonna knock a packet down before the game, <laughs> just so it doesn't hurt you Sunday morning. Uh, we shall see. That may just put me in a worse spot. All right, all right. That's it, Cal fans. Saturday. See you Monday in high. Chicago. See you in South Bend. And of course, as always, go there.
We're driven by the search for better. But when it comes to hiring, the best way to search for a candidate isn't to search at all. Don't search match with Indeed. Indeed is your matching and hiring platform with over 350 million global monthly visitors, according to Indeed data, and a matching engine that helps you find quality candidates fast. Ditch the busy work. Use Indeed for scheduling, screening, and messaging so you can connect with candidates faster. Leveraging over 140 million qualifications and preferences every day, Indeed's matching engine is constantly learning from your preferences, so the more you use Indeed, the better it gets. Join more than 3.5 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. And listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Just go to Indeed.com slash BlueWire right now and support our show by saying that you heard about Indeed on this podcast. That's Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. Indeed. 